Welcome to another conversation in our CBS Conversation Series. We are glad you have joined us again today. We're excited to bring you stories from folks doing work to renew God's world from across our fellowship. I'm your host, John Mark Bowes, for this week, and we have a conversation about acting biblically on immigration from three good folks who are working to do just that. This event is part of CBS Conversations, a new series of live and recorded video discussions on faith and culture topics for the benefit of Christians and congregations. You can find recordings of previous conversations and the schedule of upcoming ones at www.cbf.net slash conversations. Before we start our conversation about what you can do to act biblically for immigrants, you should know that you have the opportunity to ask questions of our panelists. If you're on Facebook, comment in the panel on the right, and we will attempt to do our best to get to your questions. Unfortunately, we can't promise that we will get to every question, but we will do our best. Let me now welcome this conversation, Anir Akano, Greg Smith, and Mark Wyatt. Thanks you all for joining us today. Thanks, John Mark. Thank you. Thank you. So the title of this conversation today, I must admit, is a bit different than some might expect. I think folks might typically expect us to have a title that's something like thinking biblically about immigration. So what do you see as the reason there should be a shift from thinking biblically about immigration to acting biblically about immigration? And I'll, whoever wants to go first can just jump on in. I'll go first. <laughs> um, you know, as followers of Jesus, we are called to not think about what God's word is. We're called to act on God's word. Um, and I, we don't have any better example than in the example of Jesus. We have example that Jesus came and he acted on the word of God. He acted on the law. He didn't just go about preaching it, but he actually practiced it. And as followers of Christ, we are called to live out God's word. And this is the reason why it's time for followers of Jesus to not only think about scripture, we should know scripture and we should have theological foundations on why we do what we do, but there comes the time where we need to act and do um, sim f similar to what Micah 6, 8 um, tells us to do. It's to do, right? It's not to just think. Yeah, that. Yeah, Micah 6, 8, I think is especially instructive, not just not just in this conversation about immigrants and refugees, but about in a bigger kind of justice sense about, obviously to do justice is, is a command we're given. And even, I mean, Jesus himself is the fulfillment of that in, yes. in Luke chapter four, right? When he reads the scroll and then says, truly this has been fulfilled in, in, in your presence today. So uh, yeah, that's a, that's a good word in here. Greg or Mark, what, what do you all think? Well, I would just add that um, the scripture, if, if it does say anything, it's commanding us to love. Uh, the scripture from beginning to end says that our relationship with God is one based in love. And then his love for the world and our connection to God then is our love to our neighbor. I, I agree with Anira completely. And I'm thinking of the parable of the Good Samaritan where uh, a person focused on what the law says, what the Bible says, was asking, what should I do to inherit the kingdom of God? And Jesus said, uh, love your neighbor. He said, the mercy you show to those in need is directly related to whether or not you are a neighbor. And I think the the fact is we probably um, can recall the mercy that God has shown to us. And that causes a gratitude to God. God, thank you. <laughs> thank you that you love me, that you saved me, that you've restored me, my relationships with my family, with my community. And God, uh, help me now to follow that out into the world. Yeah, I think my thinking is very much along the lines of where Mark and Anira are. Um, uh, thinking and acting to me are two sides of the same coin. Uh, if you don't act on the basis of your thinking, then your thinking really doesn't have any purpose. And if you if you don't think before you act, then you act compulsively. Uh, you tend to go in the wrong direction. Um, you don't always act with wisdom. 
So you really can't think without acting and uh, you really can't act without thinking from a scriptural standpoint. But I think too many of us stop at the thinking. Um, we stop at the reflecting. Uh, we stop at the debates um, before we really move forward. And so I think from a launching pad of thinking, uh, whether that's about uh, what scripture says on love or doing justice, the next step where I think God commands us to go is in the acting. Um, it, it says in the Bible in Acts 10 that um, Peter's con confession to Cornelius that Jesus went about doing good. He didn't just go about thinking about doing good. He went about doing good. And on the basis of a lot of thinking and prayer, I know, but it's but still the acting is the next step. Yeah, I, I think I think the thread that we're all that y'all are hitting on is, you know, that thinking, that reflection, that devotional aspect of it is what undergirds how we act. And I, I think that's true in just about every situation, not just when we talk about immigrants and refugees. We can talk about any issue that, uh, you know, uh, uh, Scripture speaks strongly about. Uh, we can do that. We, we've also already cited many instances of Scripture so far, and we've only been going for about six and a half minutes. I, people can often cite scripture to support many views and often on both sides of an issue. Yet in the issue of immigrants and refugees, I'm unaware of even a single scripture passage that says we should not care for immigrants and refugees. Uh, so what are the things we should seek to do when acting biblically on immigration? And what are the priorities that we should commit to? And Greg, I'll, I'll toss this question to you first. Well, I think that, uh, when we when we when we look at scripture, I think we I think we need to um, begin to reread scripture through new eyes that not just in, for the immigrant and the refugee issue, but also in a lot of other issues. But particularly reflecting today on the issue of immigration and refugees, we need to we need to pick up the Bible and read the Bible as some of the first readers read the Bible and some of the the way the the, the first actors or 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 individuals involved in the stories. When you look at, mm. at our biblical ancestors, many of them were immigrants, many of them were refugees. We read the Bible from a settled, established position. We may, we may move from time to time from one place to another uh, out for a job, uh, perhaps going on a vacation or an extended trip. Most of us though in the US have not been forced to move most of us in the U.S. have not had to leave because of violence that, 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 that forced us out of our homes. Many of those in the Bible did, including, of course, Jesus when he was a baby. We need to be able to read the Bible as migrants and immigrants and refugees would because that's so many of the stories that are in the Bible are about immigrants and migrants and refugees. I agree, Greg. And when we look at the scripture, I think we do look at it with our American cultural pers perspective and our posture, and we don't give ourselves the, the benefit of the fact that the way the scripture was presented was corporately to a people who had these uh, experiences and these stories in their history. And before it was written, it was verbally shared. They said, this is how we came to be where we are today. This is how we understood God speaking. This is what God did. This is how he responded. They told these stories to everyone in their family and in their community. I am, I have the privilege right now, and I've been doing this since March, of reading the Bible with a refugee, one from the Middle East. And if you've not had that opportunity to let the scripture speak for itself and see the response of someone who has a has no history like we do uh, of Christianity and no history as Americans. It is astounding. It is just powerful. And oftentimes it's hard for us to move forward in what the Bible is saying, because our, my friend wants to talk about what he's hearing. He wants to talk about how this is impacting his understanding of his own family and where he's come from. This, the Bible is a powerful message and we should just let it speak for itself and then respond to it. Thank yeah, you. I, I had a I had a, a professor in seminary who talked about the world in the text and finding ourselves in the world in the text. So I think that's I think that's good. And you know, what what are your thoughts about this? Um, you know, going along the same um, 
conversation that Greg and Mark were talking about, um, I, I agree. We need to go back and we need to think about where did we come from? You know, there's a time where the Pharisees um, question Jesus. When were we slaves? <laughs> right? And we continue to see the people of Israel fall into the same patterns all the time. And here we have the Pharisees and they ask themselves, when were we slaves? They forget their story. And I believe that when we forget our stories, when we forget the stories of our ancestors, we forget to care and empathize with those who are before us. It's important to remember where we came from. Our country, speaking specifically about our country, um, is made up of immigrants, right? And many people believe, well, my, my ancestors or my grandparents came because of this reason, or they came because of that reason. They all came because there was a need. No one, no one goes to another country just because they, uh, they thought it would be fun, right? Um, maybe for as a tourist, but to move to another country, to move everything that you have, to move uh, your most dearest, uh, everything you're moving away from, uh, you know, there's a need. And so I think that uh, we should, in order to seek to do, um, we need to first think, where did we come from? And empathize with that. We need to remember that our loved ones came for a purpose and we need to, when we look at immigrants, we need to look at them that way and consider them that way. We need to have compassion and we need to empathize. Um, I've said this before, when a follower of Jesus can no longer have compassion or empathize, I have to question their walk with the Lord. Mm. Because in everything that Jesus did, uh, whether it was healing, um, whether it was feeding, whatever miracle, we, we see that he has compassion and he empathizes, right? Uh, even coming to this world, Jesus as a migrant first from, from being with the Father and coming into this world. Why? Because God had compassion on us, right? And, and wanted to empath and empathize with us. So I believe that if we're going to act biblically, we need to start with compassion, with empathy, and remembering our ancestors. And here, yeah, that's, yep, that's pretty. Oh, go ahead, Mark. No, go ahead, Mark. I, I was just going to, because you're speaking to my heart, uh, Yanira, and um, I'm a CBF field person. I've been uh, privileged and honored to be one uh, with the fellowship for 24 years. But we started by being sent to a faraway land on the other, other side of the earth. We had to get everything we owned down to 10 suitcases with two children under the age of three. That was no small feat. Then fly for days until we were so jet lagged, we didn't even care about the 10 things, 10 suitcases we brought. And when we got to this new host country, we couldn't speak a word. We, we, we were totally vulnerable. And if it weren't for those that welcomed us and helped us to do the simplest things, we would have been totally lost. But even then, even though we had help, we struggled. We struggled with the language. We struggled with t daily tasks like shopping. You, you couldn't jump in a minivan and go to a grocery store. Everything was carrying it by hand and riding buses that didn't always fully stop. It was not an easy experience for us and we were so homesick i mean if you've if you've been homesick <laughs> to the point where you cannot go home i mean it's not like you get homesick and then you just okay we're gonna go see family because we mess up. you can't come back and you feel stuck there's a weight that just blankets you that was an experience that God used in our lives, my life, to help me be able to take the scriptural mandate that I heard as a call to go and more fully appreciate what it was going meant mm. and being with people was about. I mean, I got reduced to zero. Mm -hmm. I, I don't want that for everyone. I don't want anyone on this call today to think that they have to be reduced to zero or crushed under the weight of such homesickness and 
discomfort culturally, but if we could get back in touch, at least with some of our relatives who remember the stories of our families that came to wherever we are in this country, and if we can listen rather than always speaking to the people that we meet that are foreigners coming to our country and listen, we'll hear those stories. You're right in here. No one chooses to do this unless they are sent or forced. Mm -hmm. We're not tourists. We're not talking about tourism. You know? We're talking about migration of people uprooting their families to stay alive or in our context to go with the good news to people who haven't heard it. That's a hard thing. Yeah, I, I think, Anira, your words uh, were both challenging, but also deeply inspiring, too, because we can we can offer real hope to folks that might not have a lot of hope in that moment. Uh, you know, I think that's that's a real powerful uh, opportunity for us to engage with folks. And you know, that's also why it's so important that that's one of our global missions kind of identities and distinctives about global migration, right? Uh, you know, that impacts so much of what field personnel like Mark and Greg and, and others who are dealing with every day in their ministry. It's important that we that we keep acting biblically on 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 these things like global migration. So I, those words are I find both challenging in a good way and also really inspiring to keep to keep doing that work. I, I'm curious to know what are some of the priorities that communities of faith should commit to when when we're talking about acting biblically for immigrants. Greg, Greg, what are some of those priorities you think of? Oh, um, I think listening to the stories as we've talked about, gauging our ears, um, engaging our eyes to look around us. Um, immigrants, immigrants and refugees, um, especially certain types of immigrants who are going to feel more vulnerable than others tend to live in the shadows, uh, desire to live in the shadows, to live under the radar. Um, they're not invisible, but nevertheless, they're not always as visible as maybe some other segments of the population. And because of that, we don't tend to see them. We don't tend to see the immigrant or the refugee, and therefore we don't listen to them and we don't hear their stories. Um, I think I think it behooves congregations to be intentional about looking in their communities for where for immigrants, refugees, or as the Bible might generically call them, the stranger, uh, are. Where are they in our neighborhoods? Um, where are they down our streets? Where are they in the marketplaces that we shop or the places that we go? Um, we need to have eyes to see as well as ears to hear. And as we see and as we hear, one of the things that we became very much aware of um, when we began ministry, especially here in the U.S. among the immigrant population after serving overseas, is the absolute importance of building trust and building relationships. Um, we are so programmatic minded as a society that we tend to place all of our eggs in the program basket. If we just create the right program, if we just create the right service, if we just create the right... Immigrants aren't looking for programs or services as much as they are friends, people who will listen people who will share, people who will sit down and have a cup of coffee or a cup of tea or a, a pupusa for us in our Latino con uh, context uh, of the Salvadoran population or tortilla or whatever it might be, to listen and not always to speak. That's, that I think is, is extremely important for congregations who want to reach um, a segment of the population that's not always visible. Yeah, I would just I would just add to that, Greg, that uh, the circumstances surrounding uh, public policy right now regarding refugees and immigrants um, can feel make us feel powerless. You know, overwhelmed. Uh, we're just one person, or we're just one family, or one church. How how can we make a a difference in such a big, dramatic 
uh, situation and need in our country. And, and as we know, we're seven days away from from an election, which uh, I I am hopeful we're going to see some changes that are very ne- very much needed in our country regarding our policies. However, I was very moved this summer when CBF Advocacy led a prayer movement that, to my memory, had over 10,000 people uh, viewing our prayers and participating with us, and who knows how many beyond what we were able to see there. Can you imagine if we would take the next seven days, the next seven days until the election, and we would just pray, Lord, you're, God is not surprised at all by what's happening here. Uh, I am, but God's plan is not changed from the beginning, and he is involved. He is moving. I want to be in touch with that. I say, Lord, show me. How do I respond in these days that seem dark? How do I respond as a faithful follower of Jesus? And Lord, I want to just stop talking and listen. And, and if all of us would just do that, how would that, what would happen if we just inspired people, take these next seven days and don't worry, take the seven days to pray. Thank you for sharing that, Mark. I think that's very powerful. Um, another thing that I think that is very important for us to, to put into priority is to raise up the voices of immigrants, um, not to showcase them, but to be to allow them to share their stories, you you know Greg shared about you know having one on one, but I think there's also power in allowing them to share their stories. Um, just a few years ago and just a few days ago, two of the dreamers from my church were able to share their stories. This has made a big impact in their life. It's made a big impact in our community. And it's important to allow them to share their stories. I remember um, going to an elementary school nearby. My husband and I, who didn't have children at the time, were asked to be on the PTA. (laughs) Don't know how that happens, but we were asked to be on there. And as we were uh, discussing with the families how they, um, you know, just the leaders of the PTA, we wanted to know more about them. We shared with them that our church has an immigration um, pro- uh, services uh, for the community. And as I was sharing this, one of the families broke up crying and immediately started sharing her experience, that how fearful she was that she, every day that she went to go drop off her children, she didn't know if she was going to be able to pick them back up. Um, she didn't know if anybody was going to be able to pick them up because she was afraid that maybe she would be picked up and deported in, while the, her kids were at school. It was powerful to hear her speak to the to the school administration. It was powerful to hear her speak to the other parents who li- who said, "Wow, we didn't know that our families were going through this pain." It's important to allow them to speak. Um, to, you know, I, something that is concerning to me, um, someone who lives in a community of immigrants and refugees as well, where we, 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 as followers of Christ, sometimes we only speak up of issues when they are all over the news, right? Um, there have been deportations of parents for for years, I grew up in in, in a home uh, where both of my parents are immigrants, and two of my two of my siblings are immigrants as well. Um, and this is not new. The children have been separated from their families for many years. And while immigrants are like, "Yes, you're on board now," we need you to not just follow what the new, what's going on with the news. We, as followers of Christ, need to be engaged to the voices of immigrants and listen to them and then get involved, but not when it comes on the news, not when it's important to national news or to elections, but even if we have the ideal (laughs) uh, political party uh, for immigration, we still need to be um, advocating. We can't just wait until we have crises or we see crises. 
Uh, but these issues have been happening for years as I remember as a child myself going with my parents and, and thinking and being around immigrants who are undocumented. But we need to, the church, it, um, followers of Christ, we need to be attentively listening to voices, raising voices, and we need to be advocating at all times. Yeah, I would mean, just echo that too, Anira, yeah. that um, Wes Browning is actually in charge of our conversation today. He's behind the scenes. Hello, Wes. And he does fantastic work for Global Missions, producing, uh, offering for Global Missions videos. In 2017, just as we were getting started here in the Raleigh area, uh, Wes came and shot three videos. One of the videos was about a man named Jay, who was a former U.S. military advisor that was allowed to come uh, here and uh, stayed at Welcome House, which is our ministry in Raleigh. Uh, Jay was willing to let his story be told, and it was captured perfectly. Uh, that that video, uh, by the way, Jay went on to move to Fayetteville, where it's Fort Bragg, a military base is located. He uh, has become a Green Beret and an American citizen. Wow. Uh, Jay's still in the area. I hear from him from time to time, and he's really uh, advancing wow. career-wise, and also uh, uh, I think he's probably going to get married soon I, a lot of stuff here but jay's story is powerful i i had the privilege to share that story uh at a church uh here in raleigh with a guest of welcome house from afghanistan who had been like jay before about two years ago and i showed the video to a, a whole fellowship hall full of folks it was like a joint sunday school and many of those present were veterans when I finished telling the showing the story, I stood up and said that for me, I saw Jay as a veteran, that he had served alongside us. He had served for the same purposes that we wanted uh, to see and that I saw him as a veteran. And then I turned to the fellow with me. His name is Muji. And I said, and Muji also served with our U.S. military. And you know what happened? That whole room stood up and clapped because they could identify with what it was like to be a veteran and they could see them as people now, not as foreigners, not as people from another country, not as people that might have a different worldview or a view of God, but they saw them could identify with people who'd been on the front lines together. That humanized that story. I'll just end it quick, John, by saying the welcome that that church extended to him, to Mujib, our friend. Mujib made a profession of faith and was baptized in that church. He's a member of that church here in Raleigh. And I think it's directly related to he could hear the good news of Jesus Christ when it was extended in the fellowship of a real congregation. Yeah. Yeah, that that those kind of things are just really powerful stories, I think. You know, and you know, you were you were talking about lifting up the voices of immigrants and refugees, and you know that's one of the things I'm proud about about CBF advocacy. And most folks who see it don't really realize what this is, but our logo is of a microphone, mm -hmm. and our uh, our our posture, our attitude isn't about we we don't say giving a voice to the voiceless because everyone has a voice. We want to pass the mic so that those people can be heard. Mm -hmm. um, and I think it's I think it's first through hearing them that we can we can actually strive for change that is significant, that's impactful, that protects folks, that offers, that offers uh, a gospel message in a time where that's hard to see. Uh, I, I also think too about um, our, global, our global missions commitments and our commitment to long-term presence. And that's another way of how we work to, to build relationship with folks and not just uh, seek a, a one-off answer and, and try to get it done in a weekend uh, instead, we say, no, we, we want to walk with you as as this journey progresses so that we can offer we can we can we can hope to offer the presence of Christ to you. And I think that is I think those are two things that are really powerful in CBF and about how we seek to do this work. And folks like you are doing this work and have done this work for for a good amount of time. I, I want to move us to our next question here. And uh, we've kind of already talked about this, but what in your experience? has helped move the needle, so to speak, on acting and caring for immigrants and refugees. And Greg, we'll, we'll go to you first with this one. 
there have been many experiences. Um, uh, we've we've talked about listening to stories and we've talked about seeing. Um, but I go back to that kind of that that idea of of being able to see when we came back from from uh, Costa Rica in 1999 um, and we began to see that there was a segment of the population that was not able to engage with the rest of the community. Um, we saw a community that was not responsive or did not really know how to engage a segment of the population and was in some ways wanting to, they were so the social service agencies and other organizations, churches were wanting to reach out to the immigrant refugee community, but they did not know how. Um, and there were at that time, mainly immigrant young men in the area. It was not as many families in our area as it was young men who had come to work, uh, perhaps to work for a season or two or for a short time and, turn, and, and return home. Sometimes that happened, sometimes that didn't. Nevertheless, they were here, they needed community um, and they didn't know where to get community outside of their own, um, th their own segment, you might say, of the population, which was great. And they found community there, but really not were able to engage in the larger community. So I think what, what moved the needle for us when we first came back was to be able to to try to figure out how to bridge that gap, to realize there was a gap there between the agencies and the community that either wanted to know or didn't know, and the immigrant community that uh, didn't always engage as well as they probably could have because they just lacked the ability to do so for whatever reason that might be. And so by seeing that, that's really when we began to think about our own nonprofit, Lucha Ministries, um, and, um, and be able to to see what we could do to perhaps begin to bridge that gap. And as we did, we got, we got to know both the immigrant population as well as the larger um, non-immigrant population to see where the needs were. Years later, um, it's been now just four, five, six years ago, we realized that after we had been doing a lot of direct um, services and um, uh, with, with feeding, um, uh, services and other types of direct ministries, we began to realize that one of the things that our, the immigrant community needed as much as anything that would move the needle uh, quite a bit in our area was to be able to provide low cost immigration legal services. Mm -hmm. And so we've engaged in that over the last six to, uh, four to five years, um, six years, I guess now, and uh, have been able to provide more of a long term um, benefit for immigrants who, 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 who are searching for uh, the ability to be able to adjust their status here legal in the country. So there have been many things that we have that have kind of moved the needle as we have seen through the years what actually needed to be done. It's mainly been just be responsive to the needs that we see in front of us. One thing that moved the needle powerfully for me was um, we were invited to come to Canada, to Toronto, and help an upstart ministry called uh, Matthew House, which was basically allowing people a place to stay other than a homeless shelter that were refugees and, and asylum seekers. And I was very involved with that. One day I was down at the house with my son, John Mark, who uh, at the time was four. And the guest at the house at the time around lunch hour was a man named Juma. And Juma and I were similar in age and he had a son with him, Tariq. Now, John Mark and Tariq, they couldn't speak each other's languages, but that didn't keep the two little boys from being little boys and doing what little boys do. But I was at the table with a man I couldn't speak his language. And as I was passing the bread to him for lunch, I, I had, I had a, an aha moment where I felt like the Holy Spirit spoke to me and said that he loved this man, God loved this man, and that I never would have met him other than God brought him to that ministry. And God brought us to that ministry. It was an, a, a divine uh, introduction that God said. And I saw him suddenly as a father, not as a refugee, 
not as a man I couldn't speak to because I didn't know his language, but as a man who loved his son and his family, wanted the same things for his family as I want for mine. And something came, a lot came on. I'd been in ministry for so many years. I'd been in other countries serving, been on so many planes, so many projects. But that day, it changed for me because I could identify. It wasn't that he was a project anymore. Mm -hmm. You understand? He became a person, and I think I was saved. I had the, 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 mm -hmm. the, the things come off my eyes and my heart and my ears so I could see a person. The other thing I would say real quickly is when we were asked to come and serve in North Carolina, we started from zero. Of course, now we spoke the language. Uh, we know what basketball and hot dogs are, you know, like our family lived here. So we didn't feel like we were uh, outsiders. But where do you actually meet somebody? And so our, our first few months, we're trying to locate who is in direct contact with the people that we want to serve. And that was a little bit of effort. I find that many times Christians and churches ask that question to us. How did you meet somebody? How did you start? It's not obvious. But in one scenario, we had a church that wanted to partner with us, and they were asking, how can they help? One of the members of the church was a retired nurse. And we had a refugee family that we had been introduced to by a local refugee partner agency who had a very a unique and dangerous health issue of a child and a family. Now, when we heard about this, we talked long and hard, me and Kim, about should we share this need with this retired nurse from a church because it was gonna be a big one. This was gonna take a lot of time and effort and we weren't sure the timing was great on making a partnership <laughs> relationship with the church. So we stepped back from that and said, you know, it's not about us and about our relationship with this church. It's about this child and God's work in this family. And here's a person who has the insight and giftedness to know how to respond as a volunteer. We introduced Joanne to this family. Let me tell you something. It not only changed Joanne's view of mission, it changed the church's view of their neighbor. You see, this neighborhood where this family lived was only a couple of miles from Joanne's church, but the church knew nothing about the neighborhood because you know what? They weren't looking for it. But this one individual who used her giftedness and her experience to love this one family and help this one child, it changed the dynamic of the future of that church's mission in the community. That was a place where we could have messed up if we had tried to keep that to ourselves. But by trusting that God is at work and God is at work in individuals' lives and turning that to them and saying, be faithful. We saw this powerful thing happen. That also changed the direction of how I see ministry. Because Kim and I can only do so much with so many. But if the church, if our communities of churches and faithful will collaborate and will go to the effort to know who their neighbors are and use the giftedness of their individual members as they feel called out, Friends, there it is. It, it's about God's work in the world and us as his as his missionaries, as his leaders, as his mm -hmm. teachers uh, in churches to inspire the congregation to do the call. Go and be neighbor. Go and do likewise is what Jesus. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Thank yeah. And Nira, what are you what are your thoughts? Well, um, thank you for both of you for your for speaking on those things are beautiful. Um, one of the things that our church has done, has strived to do is to really get involved with our community, um, to learn what are the needs of our community, but not just um, those who live in our community, but also to learn to get involved with um, local governments, uh, local resources, and in order to connect immigrants to the resources that they might um, have a need for. Uh, for example, Im um, immigrants who are not here, um, who don't have a, a, a residency or green card or a citizenship, they don't have uh, the ability to receive government funding, government benefits. Uh, but there are community resources that they can um, go to. And um, 
And so we are able to connect them to that. Another thing our church has done a lot of is educate our, the children of, of these immigrants uh, the importance of becoming educated and con getting them connected to the education systems to go to college. Um, another thing that our church saw a big need was um, to open up what we call the Ruth Project for Im um, Immigration Services. Our church um, always uh, worried about those who are trying to um, trying to process their immigration paperwork who would be taken advantage either by lawyers or by uh, what we call here notarios, which is a notary public who would state that they could do uh, immigration paperwork. Um, because an immigration lawyer can off the bat, off the bat can charge you anywhere between three to $5,000 starting off, uh, depending on the paperwork. And that's, that's a lot of money. That's on, that's on top of what immigration already charges you. Um, and you have to do renewals ever so ever so often, and so um, we would refer our our, um, our people in our community to another immigration services, Light of Hope Immigration Services, up in Plano with a friend of mine. Her name is Gloria Granal, but she was up in Plano, and she has there's so many people who need her. And Fort Worth to Plano is about an hour away, um, and to leave work for, you know, to drive an hour, to be there an hour, come back an hour, that was a lot. So, you know what, we said, we as a church, we have to do something. And so along with our friends, we uh, we began the Ruth Project where um, it's an immigration service center for people in our community to come and see if they can, if there's a way they can process their paperwork. Uh, for those who are, who are eligible, they're able to get uh, very inexpensive legal help. Um, so that they can um, become, so that their documentation, um, they can go through a legal process and documentation can change here in this in, in this country. And the fees are very low for them. It's really in, inexpensive, especially for people who are, um, who come f for women or just people who have been abused, uh, we're able to help them at no cost. And so that has made a big difference in our community. Our community knows us, our community knows that they need to have a need or there's a, any kind of need that they can come to us. We might not have the answers, but it's okay because we're gonna direct them to somebody who will have those answers. But that's where, it, where we started to know who our community is and who our community is and connect them to others. One of the way, other practical ways that we have helped advocate um, is by simply advocating. We go um, and, and we speak to our community leaders, we speak to our government, our, our state leaders, our country leaders. And the best way that we've been able to do this is to just go and to bring somebody with us. And um, I myself have learned along the way, I'm no expert by any means, but if I can have a 10 minute conversation with the lawmaker, I will do it. I will do, I will go, I'll go to anybody and I'll have that conversation. They might think I'm crazy. They might think I'm just this little <laughs> um, Hispanic lady who came out of the woods, but I'm willing to go and I'm willing to take others with me to teach them and um, how it is that you just go to representatives and say, this is the need of my community and you need to do something about it. Immigrants are in our community, they matter and you, it, they need to matter to you as well because their children are American citizens. Yeah. So that's right. I think too, John Mark, I would just say that the local school is a great place to reach out yeah. and ask how might I, as a member of the public, be a help to the school in the classroom, especially an ESL Absolutely. together with a social worker in the school. Yeah. Those are the places in the people, for examples, that are in touch with our neighbors, and that might be a good way to bridge into how to meet them. I think it's yeah. meeting somebody and advocating at least for one person, just just know one neighbor and go and be involved in their life. The Holy Spirit will lead us as to what we do with that. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. I think what, what Anira and, and Mark have touched on uh, are in, in, in just kind of bringing it together in my mind is the, the importance of collaboration with others and the importance of knowing your community. We've, we discovered very soon that in, 
working with the immigrant population in order to do the best job we could. It wasn't just a matter of knowing who the immigrant population was. It was a matter of knowing who those in our community that we could work together with that also wanted to serve the immigrant population. Or if they didn't have an immediate desire, we could spur that desire in them. And mm -hmm. a lot of times, a lot of times we like to do things on our own. We feel like we have all the resources or or whatnot. And that's really not a healthy position in, in working with the immigrant population. We can't do it ourselves. Our local nonprofit can't do it ourselves. So we work with the schools and we work with the local um, legal services or the local social service agencies or whatever they might be. And, and the churches especially. And as we collaborate together, we're able to bring our resources together. I think that is so important. It's not just a matter of knowing who you are wanting to work on behalf of, but who you are also working with. And and what Zanir and Mark have said have been perfect. I, I also want to step into that and just say, for those that are on this uh, conversation with us today, you may consider, you may think that your church isn't ready to take action or that your one voice uh, in one Sunday school class and you know, to bring it up might <laughs> cause a conversation that you're not ready for. But listen, uh, as Greg mentioned, when we collaborate with other Christians and other people with the heart for refugees and immigrants in our community, we, we, we discover that God's at work among people. And God may be using this you, if I'm talking to you today, God may be using you to prompt that move of the Holy Spirit in your church. But first, you yourself go get involved. Just go and volunteer at the school, go and engage the local refugee agency or the other organizations, help or whatever organizations, or even churches that are doing things already. Go and get involved so that you can speak from experience and you can show someone in, in your church or in your Sunday school class or your family, here's how I've met this neighbor, here's what I'm doing. That that's so important in building bridges and practical ways to help. So, Mark, I'm glad you, you got us onto the subject of churches. I, I'm I'm curious about what you all think churches can do in this in this mode, and I I'd love to hear from each of you two things that churches can do to work to act biblically on behalf of immigrants and refugees. So we'll, we'll go with you, Anira. What are two things churches can do? Um, well, as I mentioned before, is to get involved in the community with immigrants. Uh, either, um, as we were talking earlier, either collaborate with another organization um, or, you know, start something, start ESL classes. There's a lot of immigrants, uh, immigrants from all over parts of the world who need to either have a, a speaking buddy, somebody who they can practice their English with, um, and what an opportunity to share the love of Christ with that person right? Um, but also it's an opportunity to hear their story, to really know what it is that is going on in their community. So the church can um, either collaborate, work with others, uh, but the church also needs to, to speak up. The church needs to say, we, um, you know, are, we come from immigrants. You know, we are yeah. Uh, our ancestors immigrants. Jesus himself was an immigrant, and we are going to treat our immigrant neighbors as we would want to be treated. The church needs to take a stand. It should not be quiet. It should not be silent. The church is very good at being very loud about other things, but not about who Jesus calls us to be. And that is to be the light, to love others, um, to to love others as we, you know, to treat others the way we want to be treated. There's so many things that the church can do for immigrants. and being against immigrants is not one of them. Uh, being against immigrants is being against Jesus himself. Mm. Um, as Jesus being one, Jesus was, was an immigrant in so many ways. He was a refugee. He was a dreamer, <laughs> uh, right? Uh, he, uh, he was an immigrant to this world. So there's so many things that we need to do. We need to see Jesus in the lives of our community. We need to see Jesus in our immigrant brother or sister. Uh, the Good Samaritan never asked why the person, the, the man who was hurt, never asked, did you have papers? Did you come here the right way? He never asked, uh, well, what did you do to get yourself into this problem? No. Right. He acted in love and took care of him. 
And that's what Jesus asks us to do. He doesn't ask us to ask. He asks us to act on love. And that's what the church can do. Stand up. Speak up. Greg or Mark, two things churches can do to act on behalf of immigrants and refugees. Well, um, I've seen a lot of best practices, to be honest with you. And picking two from the list, I, I guess the first I would say is uh, start the conversation from the pulpit and have a series of conversations that follow up from the pulpit so that you have a church conversation. Have a joint Sunday school that follows a theme of, as Yanira and Greg has pointed, have pointed out very well, invite those who are from the community, come and share their story. Invite those who are the heroes in the community that are serving and loving the people that we're talking about to come and talk what they're doing and let the congregation talk about it. And do that in a safe place. Say to people, it's okay to have a difference of opinion on these issues, but let's talk about it in a civil way. Let's talk about it as a church. That would be one. And I've seen some churches do this by uh, having a series, picking a time in the year when they want to do it, uh, and letting others come in. Because, you know, if you invite Greg or Yanira to come and speak at your church, uh, on like if you did this for four weeks and you had them come speak at the first week, you know, all the energy can go toward those two people that came or that person that came and told us the stuff, and but then they, they're going to leave, right? So, you know, you can put it over on 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 the guest speaker uh, first. I think the second thing that I would say is uh, you don't have to go it alone. I I do think that oftentimes uh, churches consider their budget, uh, their people, their knowledge their experience above the, I think the question that missionaries ask is not what, what can the missionary do when he or she comes into a community? The missionary says, what needs to be done? Not, not what can they do, but what needs to be done? And from that kind of question, it opens up the possibility that we can work closely as it's been said many times today with others who have more experience or have some insight to it working collaboratively, collaboratively together. You know, friends, uh, we have a history of cooperating well when it comes to money. But can't we learn from that experience of cooperating with sharing money to cooperating with sharing resources and energy and giftedness of our congregations? Surely we can do this too. Let's get back to working as a people of God instead of one particular group of people at one address in one street in one town. That's right. Greg, what do you think? What are two things churches can do? One of my homiletics professors said years ago that to, to in order to preach and preach well, you need to, in one hand, have the Bible in one hand and the local uh, newspaper current events in the other hand. Hmm. Of course, that was long before social media. Um, we now have access to news literally around the world instantaneously. We need to inform ourselves better of what is happening in other countries that, is, that are the things that are forcing people to make the decisions that they don't want to make of having to uproot their lives and uproot their families and move, yeah. whether it's war or whether it's violence, whether it's gang violence, whether it's hunger, whether it's disease, Whatever it is, as Anira said earlier, families do not do this uh, on the spur of the moment and say, hey, it sure would be a lot of fun to just move. Uh, let's just uproot our lives uh, and, and go somewhere else. Families don't do that. We wouldn't do that. and They don't either. What's causing them to do that? And what are the effects on themselves and on, um, and on their families? What are the effects on their country? At the same time, I would encourage our churches, as I said earlier, to reread the Bible. And I would, I would challenge our churches to read four stories. Yeah. Read Jacob and his family leaving Israel for Egypt. Read the, the Israelites leaving Egypt and migrating for 40 years before they actually find home. Read Ruth and why she left. Mm -hmm read Jesus in Matthew 2 and see if you can find any 
congruence between what happened then and what's happening now. I guarantee you, you will. So what is new is old. And I would encourage our churches to reflect deeply and theologically mm. from the scripture with their eyes on the world. I think it could change all of us radically to do that. Yeah. yeah. I, I want to get to a question from a viewer real quick before I pose one last question for us today as our time is kind of running out. And we have a viewer who asks, how does immigration uh, and immigration uh, work impact racial equity and justice. Uh, what, are, what, are your, what are our thoughts about that? Uh, off of the top of my head, as I think the, the question should be the other way around. How does racial equity and justice impact immigration? Mm. As um, we can see that because of racial inequality and justice, racism, is the reason why we have some so many of the immigration policies we have now is the reason why we have this ban on certain um, countries not being able to come into this country and so that I think the the root of the question is really the racism and inequality and justice that leads to the immigration issues that we have in this country right now i totally agree in here and i would say that much of what we see right now in our country a response to injustice and inequity uh, and majority power uh, over minorities uh, is from 400 plus years of bad immigration policy. And if we think as a people that we can treat people the way we're treating them right now, and this isn't going to stay with us for another 400 years, we're, we're terribly mistaken. We, we have a responsibility as Christians to speak into these issues and to stand with those that are vulnerable and to uh, ask others demanded that we do things that are humane and according to the biblical mandate of loving God with all we got in our neighbor as ourselves. We have to do this. That's right. Yeah. I, Greg, anything else? No, no, that's great. Yeah, yeah I agree. Totally. Yeah. And you're, I think you're absolutely spot on. It, it, the question has to get, has to get reframed. It's not about how does immigration impact racial equity and justice, but it's about how racial equity and justice should impact immigration and our policy there towards that, our, our posture towards immigration. I think that's absolutely right. And it's in reframing that question that we can really work to act biblically for immigrants and refugees too. Uh, so thank you for that. Our, our last question real quick today, you know, we've talked a lot about prayer. So as we are one week out from an election, what is the one thing that you all want us to pray for, uh, for immigrants and refugees as we head it off into this next week before the election? What's the one thing to pray for? And uh, whoever wants to go first, I'll let you go first. Well, I'll just say that the president determines the numbers of, of people we help every year. And since this, this administration has been in place, we've had an 80% cut from what we were doing to where we are today. And this last determination which has come out is that we would help only 15,000 people in the coming year. Now we had a number of 18,000 this current year and only 10,800 people were allowed. Them. These are people who've been vetted, the people have been waiting, uh, they come in the way we ask and yet only that many came. If, if we could simply understand that we have from the top to the bottom to pray that God will touch the hearts of our pharaohs, our kings, our government leaders, change their perspective. Listen, it's overwhelming the numbers of people in the world that need help have been displaced. And this is such a drop in the, bu in the bucket to be able to help people. Uh, please pray that on the other side of this election, we will get back to some normal approach to legal immigration and a heart to help people who are trying to come to our country the way we've asked them to. Yeah. Anira. Uh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh. Go ahead. Which go ahead. Anira, go ahead. Um, I would say definitely be praying for immigrants who are putting a lot or feel like oh, there's a lot on the line for them at this time. In 2016, um, I will say that those in my community felt devastated. Um, pray that 
God would bring peace, no matter the outcome, mm -hmm. um, on immigrants, and so that and that, that not only would God bring peace on immigrants, but that they would bring peace because they know the church is going to be the ones that is going to make the difference for them. The mm. church is going to stand up with them. That that would be the peace that is put in their hearts. Yeah. Greg, what, what about you? And, and and my prayer is, first of all, a thanksgiving to God that God has not forgotten the immigrant mm -hmm. and the refugee and that God would that God would lead God's people and God's world not to forget either. Yeah. Yeah. May it be on earth as it is in heaven. That's right. That's right. Amen. Uh, well, thank you to those of you who have been watching and offering terrific questions for us today. The work of acting, acting biblically for immigrants and refugees is vast. Our partners in CBF churches and communities across the U.S. who are doing this work are vital to extending the presence of hospitality and being an instrument for God's justice. I want to thank you, Anira, Greg, and Mark, for, uh, for, the for your gracious use of your time today uh, and for their wise, and your wise words about protecting and caring for all immigrants. But also thank you for the tireless work you put in daily to protect, care for, and advocate for refugees and immigrants. You all are truly the presence of Christ. Thanks y'all for attending today and I hope everyone has a blessed conclusion of their week. Thanks y'all. Thank you. Thank you.